think about it is you're going to say, oh, well, I, I want to audit my cloud provider. Well, unfortunately, so do all their other customers. And that creates a situation that you should be a little sympathetic to, which is if they let every single customer stage their own complex audit, they're never going to be able to improve your service. They're going to be lucky to keep it running. So what that calls for and what is starting to be deployed are third-party auditors. Um, and these people tend to be uh, uh, very trustworthy. There's the emerging standards um, related to ISO 27000, which are the security standards. Um, people who audit those, they're being extended for cloud computing. If you can find an auditor that you trust, you can rely on them for judgments of the, uh, the cloud vendors. And, and that level of indirection may sound like more than you want, but if you think about it, it's, it's the only way to avoid overwhelming the cloud vendors. At Mimecast, we have, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of customers, many of them very small, but if every one of them did an audit of us, um, I don't know if we'd survive. Not, not because we would fail the audits, but because we wouldn't have time to do anything else. Um, so th that risk happens whenever you have an external provider. And I will also point out that that risk is happening when you have internal services. It's just that you tend to be more comfortable with it because you can go and yell at them when something goes wrong. But you know, security through yelling at your employees isn't really totally reliable either. Um, so it, there's, there, there's no perfect answer to these sorts of questions. Um, the risk of private clouds, as far as I'm concerned, is that you lose most or at least a lot of the benefits of cloud computing because you're still running the bloody infrastructure. You know, one of the whole points of this was to get out of it. So yeah, you've kept control, but you've paid quite a price. And the hybrid I just characterize as the worst of both worlds. You get to have all the problems. Um, community, uh, community clouds, as I said, they're, they're still um, almost theoretical um, in, in the real world. Um, I think their risk profile is probably pretty similar to public. There's a theoretical argument that because certain kinds of security lapse lapses will only expose your data to other people in your same industry, that it's a little more secure. Um, and if you believe that, um, I invite you to uh, leak all your files to competing lawyers, right? I mean, that's, that's probably not what you want to do. Um, oops, sorry. So uh, we at Mimecast are in this business, but we, uh, we try to do one area and one area well, and that's email. Um, which is uh, much harder than, uh, than anybody thinks when they first start thinking about it. I've been writing a series of blog entries, which you can see on our web pages, called uh, Why Email is So Complicated. Um, and I've been sort of whimsically giving them three-digit numbers, part 375 and so on. Um, but I'm pretty sure that if I ever finish it, I will have written over 100 reasons why email is so complicated. It's, it's really, really complicated. Um, so we have been gradually adding more services, but we started out in the business of email archiving and security um, pr provided via the cloud. And we're sort of um, moving towards a goal of unified email management. Everything you could possibly want to do with your email and most likely eventually other forms of communication um, we'll manage for you in the cloud. Um, so the bottom line, before I turn it over to Steve, the bottom line on thinking about a, a provider like us is your current mail admins will make mistakes. Okay? Everybody makes mistakes, and they are undoubtedly overworked. Mimecast is full of humans, so we'll occasionally make mistakes too. But because of the way the business is structured and because it's the only thing we do, we'll make fewer of them. And we'll be in a position to be very responsive if you, if you are unfortunate enough to run into them. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Steve McKenzie um, get up and tell you a little bit more about Mimecast. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, mm -hmm. I think these sessions are very much designed to have uh, a community input, lots of discussion. So I'm going to keep it very brief. This is not designed to be a sales pitch. It is very much just to give you some context about what we do, how we do it, um, and we're going to be floating around having discussions. Um, I'm quite refreshed to see that I think I can already see four Mimecast customers in the room, which is which is good to hear. So there's some real life stories, and I'll close with an honest feedback as to, <laughs> to what it is we do and how we do it and their experiences of it. But just to take you back, Mimecast has been selling or gaining customers for our SaaS offering since early 2000s, when cloud computing wasn't even a term. It was called software as a service. Um, and we came to market very early, and we took a couple of bets. And one of the bets that we placed was that the world would look like it does today. In other words, cloud computing, which is a very fashionable term, has very much become mainstream. May maybe perhaps not mainstream in terms of adoption of cloud-delivered services, but certainly mainstream in sort of 
cloud considered services. So everybody's thinking about what is it that the cloud can do for our business. We're very niche, we're very focused, and what we do is we focus on email. These slides are going to be made available to everyone, is that right? Afterwards, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to fly through. Uh, so you're going to have these slides if you want to read them, but that effectively. Um, and what we do is, again, we took a bet, that there were a couple of bets, and that was that cloud computing would become mainstream by roundabout now. Uh, we took another bet that Microsoft Exchange is not going anywhere. We do interoperate with the other mail delivered services, um, but we really have a tight integration and a partnership with Microsoft Exchange because they are the dominant um, mail server out there. What we do not do is replace Exchange. What we do do is give Microsoft Exchange a dose of steroids, we polish it up and turn it into the hero. Because as we all know, delivering an enterprise grade mail system requires a whole bunch of other things other than just the Exchange server, which is designed to be the post office, which is delivering and sending mail. Wrapped around that, we've got to take consideration of what are the external threats, all those nasties in the outside world that exist, and that's ever-changing. Someone needs to take care of that. To push that into the cloud makes sense, and people have been doing that for a long time, so, so we do that as well. It's a relatively commoditized service, and a lot of people do it pretty well. We'd like to think we do it better, um, but I'm sure if all the, um, the leading providers of email security got into a room, we'd all end up with thick noses and blood lips and all those kind of good things. End of the day, you have to be excellent at that part of the business or you don't have a business. Um, so what you do is if you come on board with Mimecast, you point your Remix records to Mimecast and your mail flows through Mimecast and we do all that security for you, the scanning, keeping the nasties from the outside world from coming in. At that point, we archive your mail in real time. Now what you do is you choose where to be served from. We have data centers around the globe, but typically you would choose as European-based customers to be served out of our EU data centers, which happen to all be in the UK, and we can guarantee data residency. So we archive it at point of entry, um, then email flows in the normal way and users consume it. Users don't even know that this is happening in the background. As you hit reply or send button, it goes out, goes out of your environment through a secure link to Mimecast where we provide data leak prevention, scanning, content filtering. We can apply signatures, disclaimers, and some cool marketing functionality if required. And then we send it on its merry way, but we store it at the same time, in real time. Now the real benefit of taking over the journey of accepting mail on your behalf, delivering it on your behalf, means that when we archive it, we archive it in real time, but not only are we archiving the mail, we're archiving all the rich associated metadata with that mail. So that is why professional services are a very strong sector for us. So um, Osborne Clark, the next speaker, is actually a customer of Mimecast. Um, and our, and our, by far and away our biggest sector is the legal sector because the non-repudiation information stored together with the archived email, all that metadata, proof of delivery, proof of receipt, as well as any policies that have been applied are all stored together with the, the mail. So it's not just an archive of mail, it's an archive in real time of all the mail and that information. And that's why we store data because we go, well, what happens if we need it? We all want to store it in there, and it's not just storage. There's a very clear distinction between storage requirements and archive requirements. If you have a storage requirement, go and put it on some cheap disk and you know it's there, that's fine. If you have an archiving requirement, your business appreciates that there's a requirement to potentially bring back that data, and bring back that data with as much information required should you be required to enter into any form of dispute. Internal sexual harassment case, for example, um, external case, um, someone's coming in and, and, and perhaps taking legal action against your organization. So as a result of being the first point of entry and the last point of exit of your mail, storing it in real time, it ensures that the chain of custody is rock solid. And as a result of that, if you ever are required to produce data in a court of law, you can produce it as evidence. That non-repudiation information is there. So we're, as the mail goes out and it's received by the receiving MTA, it sends Mimecast the 250 acknowledgement receipt that is also stored with the mail. So again, all that rich information. Now logically, if you think about us providing that MTA functionality for you, we accept mail on your behalf, do the scanning, store it, deliver it. Mail goes out, comes to us, we scan it, store it, deliver it. So we've got that archiving, we've got the inbound security and the outbound scanning. It means then that we can also provide you a real-time continuity service with an RTO, the holy grail of BCP, RTO and RPO of zero. So you will not lose any data, recovery time objective, you won't lose any time, recovery point objective, you won't lose any data. In the event that something happens down here in your environment, the exchange server falls over, there's a whole host of things that could happen, we're still accepting mail on your behalf because we're removed from your environment. 
And we have a very clever tool that sits in the Outlook client, which in the event that Exchange goes down, can take over the Exchange sending and receiving functionality by, uh, via the internet. So bypassing Exchange, when Exchange comes back online, there's an auto-sync that takes place. So at a very high level, we do email security on the inbound path, archiving in real time, inbound, outbound, and internal communication via journaling. Uh, we scan emails on the outbound path, again, storing the email in real time, and then providing you with a, um, with a continuity solution. There's a whole bunch more in terms of encryption and all those kind of things, but I won't bore you with the details. But that's what we do. In terms of the context of the discussions going on from here, as I said, we've been doing this for, since 2002, and we've been getting customers on board um, over that time when this wasn't particularly fashionable. And to give you an idea, we're, we're experiencing it's a nice place to be. We bring on board in the UK alone about 40 new customers on a monthly basis. So we're on a, a rocket ship of growth and won a whole bunch of awards and all those sorts of things. So we've got some real life experiences of addressing the concerns that people have, taking that leap of faith. Early days, there was a paradigm shift to be made about giving up control. You know, the security journey had already been cloud. People already decided that to do that and the cloud made sense. Now storing data up there is another thing that the people are, are, are shifting their paradigm. And then as Nathaniel said, where our vision really is to, to move towards data banking. So to become your storage and archiving vendor in the cloud. We have most of the data in the email uh, and we have the ability to present it back to you in a number of other formats and that's really where we're going. So uh, more than happy to answer any questions because I have conversations with people on a daily basis about their concerns. We are going to move on to building the business case, which is a very interesting topic, and, I, and I'll, I'll probably say a few words just before we do that as well in terms of our experiences, uh, because it depends. All depends, because your organizations are all different, your decision making criteria. So that's what we do, security, archiving, and continuity at a high level. Uh, but because we do it in the cloud, we can, do some, we can do some funky stuff with your data.